Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, today's presentation is on pedestrian safety in the city of Greater Sudbury. And this presentation, as uh, the chair acknowledged, is the summary of two of the reports within uh, the document tonight on the agenda. The first is summary of pedestrian collisions. So basically, it's a, a summary of um, the collisions in the past five years that have happened on the right of way in uh, the city of Greater Sudbury. And the second is on pedestrian safety initiatives. Basically, what, what's the city been doing to enhance pedestrian safety uh, in the last number of years? So the oldest and most basic method of uh, active transportation is walking. It's the fundamental part of our transportation network. Um, and the decision to walk is usually considers the distance of the trip. So for longer uh, trips, you, you choose something other than walking. Um, and it's the perceived uh, safety that you have in your route. So the safer the route is, uh, the more likely it is that uh, you'll be walking to as a form of, of transportation. Um, for many of those in the community, uh, this is the only available mode of transportation. And for all road users, um, you are a pedestrian at one point in time in your trip. So whether you walk to the transit bus stop or you walk to your vehicle or you walk to your bicycle, um, you are a pedestrian at some course in your travels. In regards to us analyzing uh, the pedestrian collisions, uh, we looked at 2011 to 2015 and we only looked at collisions within the public right of way. So what, what involvement is municipal infrastructure um, have with these pedestrian collisions? So if there was an accident within a private parking lot into a grocery store, uh, those aren't within uh, the data set before you. Um, so that's why you might see with the, the police department and our data, there might be a difference in, in number of collisions uh, because ours were sp uh, specifically focusing on the municipal right of way. We do use uh, the Greater Sudbury Police Services data um, to determine all of our, our collision reporting characteristics. Uh, so lots of the stuff you'll see within the, the collection are the tabs checked by those police officers either investigating the collision or those people reporting it to the Collision Risk Centre and the Zilda. The demographic data that we use within the report um, was provided by the Sudbury District Health Unit. So there's several key findings in regards to pedestrian collisions. Um, the first being in the last two years, they're actually down. Um, we're below the, the five year average for the city. Um, so hopefully that's a, a positive trend that continues. Um, the most common time for collisions was in November. 50% um, of them occurred when dark. Um, when, you, when you think about it, um, November is, uh, is a likely month because daylight savings time would have changed um, and you would have seen um, the sunset happen earlier with the clocks adjusting back um, and more people are, are still out there walking because the, the temperature is still favorable for pedestrians to use. The most common time for pedestrian collisions was between 5 and 6 p.m. So this coincides with rush hour traffic on people getting home and so the pedestrians would either be walking once they got home or walking to home. Um, so it's, it's likely that you'd see this because this is when the most conflicts would occur. Uh, the highest number of vehicles, the highest number of pedestrians. 74% 74, 74 of the collisions occurred during daylight and 79% occurred on clear days. Again, um, this speaks to that's when people would be walking. On rainy days you get less pedestrians um, and you get less pedestrians during the evening hours as well. So to continue on with our key findings, um, the five-year average for non-fatality, uh, non-fatal injuries is below the 2012 average. Uh, so that's a positive sign uh, for us. Um, but unfortunately, on the flip side, um, we're higher than the provincial average for fatalities. So while we have less collisions, uh, more of our collisions that we have are fatalities when compared to the provincial average. So um, when we look at what age groups are involved with these pedestrian collisions, what we find is the age group between ages 15 to 24 are involved in twice as many collisions as the next highest age group for our demographics. Again, 73% uh, of the collisions are occurring on arterial roads. Um, there are highest volume roads. Uh, they have the most number of lanes to cross. 
Um, they're the roads with most of the commercial destinations and most transit routes are accessed to arterial roads. So again, this is something that you, you would suspect uh, uh, the data would determine. 60% uh, are occurring at intersections. Uh, again, that's the most complex part of the road system. It re represents a high percentage of all types of collisions for vehicle and vehicle, vehicle pedestrian as well. And that's the, the location where we encourage pedestrians to cross. Uh, so that's where most of your conflict points are going to be is at intersections because that's where we're telling people to go. 49% um, of uh, intersection related collisions are occurring at, at traffic signals. So there's uh, either uh, yield conditions, stop condition or traffic signals in regards to the option at intersections. Um, in 37% of the case, the drivers fail to yield the right of way to the pedestrian. Uh, on the flip side, there's also um, you know, cases where the pedestrian failed to yield the right of way to the vehicle as well. In 40% of the cases, pedestrians were crossing with the right of way. So pedestrian safety has been a long time focus uh, for the traffic and transportation engineering so services section as I know it has been for Council as well. Um, many of the initiatives that we're presenting tonight had their starts prior to amalgamation. Some had their, uh, their starts in the, the previous few years, but we've carried those current practices, finished those programs, and we're currently um, continuing to adopt best practices as, uh, as new technology allows and as legislation changes. So what have we done? Um, we were one of the early adopters for pedestrian crossing policy. Um, we adopted the Ontario traffic manual when it was still in draft in terms of um, enhancing our pedestrian crossings. Um, when we look at pedestrian times, um, you know, the, the Ontario recommendation is to assume that a pedestrian can travel at 1.2 meters per second. Um, they suggest going down to a meter per second when there's uh, areas with children or seniors. Um, so staff actually undertook a study to look at, you know, what, what do we find in our community? What speeds are our residents walking at? And we found that 95% of our residents uh, can comfortably cross the roadway when walking a speed of one meters a second. So we've, uh, we've chosen to adopt one meter a second as, as our new standard rather than just areas of seniors and children. And we've implemented that on uh, some of our quarters where we've run, redone the timing, such as Paris Street and Notre Dame Avenue. And we've also looked at individual intersections that we've rebuilt as part of our capital program. So other initiatives that we have are pedestrian countdown timers. And basically uh, what this shows is the number of seconds that the pedestrian has to finish their movement while crossing a street. So as shown on the picture, this pedestrian would have 16 seconds to still get to the end um, of, of their walk while crossing the street. And the pedestrian has the right of way the whole time um, that that's counting down. Um, the other item, and we've actually brought in one for, uh, for show and tell, is an accessible pedestrian signal. Um, so one of the things that this, this device does um, while it's sitting on the pole, and it's a relatively new device to our network, is it actually has a locator tone uh, to help pedestrians to find the button. Uh, so if you're visually impaired um, and, you, and you can't necessarily see this clearly, it does include a, a faint sound uh, so the visually impaired people can find this and, and use it to cross the roadway. It has a tactile arrow, arrow on here basically like this. So visually impaired people can then feel the arrow to determine uh, which direction that corresponds to. And it ha emits specific tones depending on which direction uh, that you're crossing the street, whether it be east, west, or north, south. Um, and we work together with CNIB um, basically to um, determine locations where we install these. And CNIB actually trains uh, people on how to use these within our within our network. We've also installed pedestrian traffic signals. So there's looks six locations within our city. Uh, for one example, at the, uh, the New Sudbury Library uh, or at the South Wind Retirement Facility or on 2nd Avenue near Adamsdale Park where there's traffic signals that just basically encourage people to um, cross.
cross at that location and it stops vehicles and gives uh, people the right of way. We've also um, constructed several refuge islands um, on, on some of our busier roads um, to again enhance pedestrian safety. Uh, what this does is it's an island in the middle um, and it allows people to tr cross half the road at a time. Um, one of the ones that uh, we installed recently was on Woodbine on Barry Down Road. And what that allows is people to cross uh, two northbound lanes of traffic, stop in an, an island, and then cross the southbound lane. Um, so you don't need a gap that's big enough for you to cross the entire roadway. You need a back, uh, gap in traffic to just cross um, that the opening that's required to get to the center turn lane. We've also uh, painted several uh, enhanced crosswalk markings at some of our, uh, our busiest uh, intersections. Um, it heightens driver awareness of the pedestrian and it increases the uh, crosswalk visibility. We've got three different types, um, basically uh, ladder crosswalks, zebra stripe crosswalks, and school crosswalks. The city also has a school crossing guard program from, um, and that's facilitated by transit um, where they actually have school crossing guards out for prior to school and after school. Um, we've recently started installing uh, tactile warning panels uh, to be in compliance with the DA Act. Um, and what these do is provide guidance to those again that are visually uh, impaired to determine uh, when they're approaching a roadway and the, the, the safe um, direction to cross. Um, while this one shows brown, we've worked with the CNIB and they've suggested that we use yellow in our capital construction program. So the picture you see in front of you actually has a yellow uh, tactile warning panel there. One of the, the other items that we've installed is an uninterrupted power supply for our traffic signals. So this enhances pedestrian safety by when there's a power outage, uh, the walk lights and, and don't walk lights can still function uh, for four hours after a power outage. It has a, the benefit of also um, still working to control all of the vehicles for four hours. Um, so we can imagine a power failure before we installed these, the intersection went black um, and then you would have to use it as a driver as an always stop. And then in some of our bigger intersections, um, that becomes cumbersome with all the, uh, the approach lanes. So this allows it to, to work as in for four hours in fully functional mode, and then it goes to a flashing mode before uh, the battery uh, finally um, dies out. Coming up, there's uh, some new legislation that was passed uh, that provides municipalities the option of installing some different pedestrian crossover facilities. Um, we're coming to the next operations committee report that's going to describe these in a little bit more detail. Um, we're looking at installing these in a, a number of locations in our community and it will help uh, and, and they actually, uh, without being traffic signals, give the right of way to the pedestrian crossing the roadway. Again, in the next, last number of years, um, we've done traffic calming projects um, across the city um, and these have uh, Again, a benefit to pedestrian safety. Uh, the picture that's shown there is basically a, a ball boat at an intersection um, that narrows the crossing distance uh, for pedestrians. Um, before the ball boat that was there, uh, the pedestrians would have to cross nine meters of roadway. Um, we, we put the ball boat and then it shortens that distance to seven and a half meters. Um, so it's, it's less time that the pedestrian's in conflict with the vehicles. But what it also does is it allows the pedestrian to stand out a little bit away from the curb face. So the pedestrian's more visible to the driver and the, pedest and the, uh, the pedestrian gets to see the, the driver a lot easier as well. So there's multiple benefits to that. Channelized right turn lanes. Um, so the example you see on the picture here is uh, Brady and Paris and you'll note um, that there is protective crossings on the uh, on the enhanced uh, crosswalk painting side um, but that's entering Times Square kitty corner from from Tom Davy Square uh, the pedestrian is unprotected uh, going from uh, the, the sidewalk uh, to that island within the roadway um, so 
when we did the revitalization of uh, most of the downtown under an ISF project 2009-2010, we tried to remove as many of these channelized right turn lanes as possible. There are some areas where we couldn't for road geometry or uh, timing of the signals. Uh, we weren't able to do that. Um, so what we're uh, doing in this location is changing a little bit about how we do uh, the geometrics of it. Um, so if you see on the picture to the left, um, the way that the turn lane goes, it's more of a sweeping curve. Um, so you're kind of uh, traveling like part of a circle. Um, so you're merging. And in order to look into the lane you're merging, you actually would have to look over your left shoulder to see where you're merging into. When you're looking over your left shoulder, you're not looking forward at where a pedestrian could be. So we've done some subtle changes in the geometry uh, where you're approaching um, the, the merge point at uh, not a 90 degree angle but kind of a 75 degree angle so it's more of a, a quick turn to your left to see that you can merge into traffic as opposed to a, a turn right over your shoulder that gives more time for the people to look forward um, and then see what the, the if there are pedestrians there and to make those safe movements. Council recently adopted RP8, which is a North American uh, established guideline for street lighting. That means that streets and pedestrian uh, sidewalks will be more evenly lit and they'll be brighter as well, again, increasing safety. Uh, the City of Greater Sudbury has been a long standing member of the Sudbury Road Safety Committee. Um, one of the examples of the great work that that committee does is, uh, is their work here on Do the Bright Thing When Walking After Dark. And basically what's that encouraging is basically for um, pedestrians to wear bright clothing um, just so that you're more visible to, to those people that are driving. So what are our next steps? So there's been some, some media reports that uh, our reports before you tonight uh, didn't go in sufficient detail within the locations and you know, and, and come here with uh, changes that we're going to be doing at, at very specific locations. That's, that's what we're doing. Um, so one of the things to do is to present a little bit of the data that we've collected. Um, so there's a new program that we've got, a new software program we're doing that allows us to, to better look at this data and, and collapse it all together and, and be able to get to see it. Um, and then we're going to review a lot of these collisions where they occur. Um, and determine if there's anything that we, we can do at those locations uh, that would minimize these collisions. Um, so that's our next step. We've actually completed it on quite a number of intersections. So we've had some discussions with uh, some councillors and a pedestrian safety committee that we sit on. Um, and even some of the locations where you have a number of locations. And you could say, well, this intersection's had three or four in the last number of years. Uh, that's a high, a high incident, so why don't we look at, at the way that intersection is designed? When you boil it down to, they were basically three or four separate incidents in the, in the one location we're talking about, um, and there wasn't one thing you could do that would alleviate that. Um, lots of that would have been people turning with the right of, without the right-of-way, or pedestrians walking without the right-of-way was the cause. So there's not necessarily something you can specifically do to, to stop that from happening. Um, so we're, we're continuing to review those. Um, we want to see if there's something we can implement. And when we do implement something, um, we want to make it a smart goal, um, basically to see if that, that's working and then how we can um, basically move it to other sections of the community as well, where we might see a similar problem or we might see an intersection with similar characteristics that hasn't had a problem yet. Maybe we can implement it there before we have a problem. Um, we also want to work with our community partners in the city's uh, communication services section to develop educational campaigns. Uh, so if you remember, I talked about uh, the one section of our, our, our demographics uh, involved in twice as many collisions as all others. So we want to target those road users and see how we can educate them, uh, you know, to help improve safety as well. Um, the report you see in front of you, um, we're hoping is an annual report. And that's what our plan is to come forward. And we're not only wanting to address pedestrian collisions, but we want to broaden it out to um, an annual report on road safety in general. So it'll include uh, our most vulnerable users being pedestrian cyclists, but also in include uh, vehicles as well, um, so that we can have a, a safe road network. <clears throat> 